I'm Dr. Vikas Kohli. I'm a pediatric cardiologist and I've been practicing in this field for about 15 years. And uh, we'll briefly be talking about uh, how to approach congenital heart disease in a busy pediatric practice. So uh, we all are aware that heart disease is classified as asynotic and synotic. And uh, within each subgroup, asynotic and synotic, there is an increased pulmonary blood flow and a normal or decreased pulmonary blood flow. Now synotic versus asynotic is the first question which needs to be answered and clinically the nail beds may be blue, lips and tongue may also be blue and that's central cyanosis. But if saturation is between 85 and 93 percent, the human eye cannot detect cyanosis and that's an important fact to remember. So the gold standard for detection of cyanosis is the pulse oximeter. In fact, the pulse oximeter is called the fifth vital sign. So without a pulse oximeter, one cannot differentiate between asynotic and synotic heart disease. So the first branch off point between synotic and asynotic is actually made using a pulse oximeter. Once the saturation is below 93 percent and you are suspecting a heart problem, it is classified as a synotic heart disease. The next question is whether it is increased or decreased pulmonary blood flow, normal pulmonary blood flow. And this would further classify asynotic into increased pulmonary blood flow or normal pulmonary blood flow and synotic into decreased pulmonary blood flow and increased pulmonary blood flow. Now symptoms of increased pulmonary blood flow include increased respiration, retractions and increased infections, sweating while feeding, shortness of breath, failure to thrive and Harrison's sulcus. So is there an objective method of assessing pulmonary blood flow? Yes, the objective assessment of pulmonary blood flow to some extent is made by a chest x-ray, but these signs are extremely reliable. And on this x-ray what you see in the right hilum prominence going down to the right lower hilum is actually the right lower low branch in the right pulmonary artery. This is not a pneumonic patch and the same you see on the left side in the hilum. This is another x-ray where clearly you can see almost all the branches of the right and left pulmonary artery is going down right to the right base and posteriorly behind the heart on the left side and including the left and right upper lobe branches. These are all pulmonary artery branches and they are not classified as pneumonic patches. On the other hand, here is a huge heart with increased flow with dilated distal branch pulmonary arteries. All this indicates a decreased uh, pulmonary vascular resistance and a huge pulmonary blood flow indicating that the patient is operable and there is a lot of pulmonary blood flow which is increased. And similar findings are noted in this x-ray and in this x-ray which shows more of haziness and increased flow in the upper lobes. And this is a patient with ventricular septal defect and you can see the degree of dilated branch pulmonary arteries in the upper and lower lobes on both the lungs. These are all x-rays of VSD with similar findings and this is an extremely large VSD with the findings. On the other hand, what you see here is a prominent pulmonary bay but you don't see those dilated branch pulmonary arteries in the lung fields which indicates that central pulmonary arteries are big but the peripheral pulmonary arteries are not prominent indicating this is an x-ray of Eisenmenger syndrome. On the other hand, this is an x-ray with right RV type of apex with, without any prominence of pulmonary arteries and this is tetralogy of fallow. And here again you see very prominent pulmonary arteries which are even compressing the airways in the lower lobes causing hyperinflation in the lower airways of the lower lungs and increased flow in the upper lobes with a dilated big heart. And this one could have called a VSD but knowing from the fact that there is cyanosis in this patient we would have to classify as a cyanotic increased pulmonary blood flow and therefore would be a transposition of great arteries. And this was RV apex in a patient with increased pulmonary blood flow with saturations of 88 percent which could not be picked up by the naked eye and therefore this gets classified as a truncus arteriosus. So here we are back to the classification again and there is an increased pulmonary blood flow in the asynotic group and an increased pulmonary blood flow in the synotic group and incidentally if you have not measured the saturation and gone on to the symptoms and x-ray directly you could very well mix up the two groups and you could end up diagnosing a TGA or a truncus as a VSD or you could end up diagnosing a tricuspid atresia as a PDA if it is a ductus dependent condition, thereby making it imperative that the first classification of pulse oximeter saturation be made, the subject subclassified as synotic versus asynotic and then the increased flow classification be made on clinical symptoms or on the basis of the uh, 
X-ray findings. Once this has been done, and here is the subgroup of increased flow in the synodic, that is total anomalous pulmonary veins, transposition of great arteries, truncus arteriosus and tricuspid atresia, the four T's, while the decreased flow would be tetralogy of fallow and pulmonary atresia. Now, in atrial septal defect, secundum, suppose you have the patient in front of you and you have a diagnosis and it goes with your clinical findings, then this would usually tend to be closed to at the age of two years or after that. It is an elective closure, there is an option of device closure versus surgical closure. Both have excellent outcomes and decision regarding the mode of closure should be made by the person who is doing the intervention himself. After the first year of closure, the, uh, the patient actually requires only once a year cardiac evaluation and the patient is followed up closely by the pediatrician, not by the cardiologist. The patient does have a normal quality of life, normal lifespan and there are no limitations of MRI scanning with the device because it is MRI safe because it is non-ferrous metal. Transcatheter AS declosure advantages are rapid recovery, no scar success rate more than 98 to 99 percent, selection of the right patient is the key, no blood transfusion is required and patients with surgery had in a single study slightly lower IQs as compared to those who had transcatheter closure. When we go to ventricular septal defects, large VSDs would require closure by three months and definitely by six months. If weight gain is not appropriate or if there is pulmonary hypertension, one would need to go in earlier. Moderate VSDs are individualized while small VSDs would require closure only if there is aortic insufficiency or infective endocarditis. This is an image showing perimembranous VSDs, muscular VSDs and supracrystal VSDs. As you will see, the perimembranous and the supracrystal VSDs are close to the semilunar valves, aortic and pulmonary valve. Muscular VSDs are far away from there. Muscular VSD closure by device is an established method, preferred method, long term effects are none, far from conduction system and aortic insufficiencies unknown in these patients. And here are a sequence of images of how in the left topmost image uh, the VSD is opacified by contrast in the left ventricle and going counterclockwise subsequently the VSD is crossed with a wire and a device is placed in the uh, VSD itself which is released finally and a contrast injection the tri to right topmost image shows that there is no opacification across the VSD. Patent ductus arteriosus is a common defect and pink babies with respiratory distress when they are premature one has to suspect patent ductus arteriosus. Usual history is that the patient has been doing well and now with increased oxygen requirements or with apnea or early suspected NEC or poor perfusion has been suspected to have NEC. Diagnosis is made by echo only and one can start the therapy after echo. Usual therapy has been in the past indomethacin, but now oral or rectal brufen has taken over and there are several advantages. Only recorded difference in the PDA closure between brufen and indomethacin is the recurrence rate and the benefit as renal perfusion is not decreased with brufen. Brufen and indomethacin are equally potent in closing PDAs. Trials to evaluate long term neuro issues were needed. Prophylactic endomethacin no longer benefit in survival or long term outcome, only short term decrease in IVH. Prolonged versus short course of endomethacin, there was a decreased rate of PDA reopening. Prolonged course was associated with decreased IVH and renal impairment. PDA beyond the neonatal period, any PDA that can be auscultated needs to be closed. Any symptomatic PDA needs to be closed, silent PDAs may may not be closed in post neonatal period. After 5 kgs of baby weight, any PDA can be closed with a device. Very large PDAs, baby does not gain weight, so no point in waiting. And small PDAs management medically till about patient is 5 to 6 kilos. Success rate is 99 percent for complete closure, there is no scar, fast recovery, no blood transfusion, coils or devices can be used. Size is no limitation, the smallest baby we have done in Indraprastha Polo Hospital is 2.2 kilos and more than a thousand cases have been performed by the speaker. Tetralogy of fallow is a decreased pulmonary blood flow cyanotic heart disease and we know the four components of pulmonary stenosis, thickened right ventricular wall, ventricular septal defect and aortic override which are there in this condition. And when there is a hypersynodic spell, the RVOD obstruction increases and more deoxygenated blood gets into the aorta. The management of a hypersynodic spell includes trying not to make the child cry further, 
to sedate the patient with morphine, phenarcon, put an IV line, give a bolus of fluids which is most useful, giving IV bicarb, 1 ml per kg is also extremely useful and IV metoprolol 0.05 milligram per kg slowly over half an hour has replaced propranolol. So when do we perform surgery? If there's any hypersonoric spell, even one is enough to indicate surgery. If an infant is less than six months, one can do a BD shunt. And surgically, palliation to improve the pulmonary blood flow, one puts in a systemic to pulmonary shunt. And if SATs are approaching 75% plan for surgery, surgery is decided on the basis of age, weight of patient, pulmonary artery size, and if anatomy is favorable, weight is more than 7.5 kg, a repair can be done. If weight is more than 8 kg and anatomy is favorable, complete repair or else do a BT shunt. We've also done interventions in tetralogy of fallow patients, balloon dilatation of the pulmonary valve in cyanotic children with indication of shunt in a randomized study evaluating for postponement of palliative surgery and growth of pulmonary arteries. Other cyanotic heart diseases, ductal dependent conditions would include pulmonary atresia, severe TOF, pulmonary stenosis of a severe nature, or mixing lesions like transposition. In any of these cases, prostaglandins would need to be started early. And this is why in pulmonary atresia, a duct dependent lesion, there would be no flow in the pulmonary artery if the duct closes. And that's why prostaglandin to keep the ductus open is needed. On the other hand, uh, starting prostaglandin in a patient with transposition would add to the pulmonary blood flow by opening the ductus uh, arteriosus. Further options would include septostomy, stenting the duct in duct dependent lesions, or a BT shunt. Most important outcome related factors are an accurate echo, early transport, and to avoid infections. This is the image of septostomy being done in a baby, and diagnosing cardiac lesion in the critically ill newborn is important to the outcome of the baby. They do not present in the usual form in the newborn period. The primary presentation is either the baby is going to be blue or the baby is going to be in shock or having respiratory distress. In addition to any one of these findings, if there is a murmur or a cardiac enlargement or peripheral pulses are abnormal, cardiac disease would be high on the cards. The causes of desaturation can be intrapulmonary or intracardiac shunting. And differential diagnosis, if the baby is cyanosed all over, would include intracardiac mixing like single ventricle or intrapulmonary mixing like pulmonary hypertension. Differential cyanosis with upper limbs blue would be transposition with the PDA and lower limbs blue would be ductus, shunting right to left with normally related great arteries, as would be the case in pulmonary hypertension. So basic message is think cardiac whenever thinking pulmonary. And in shocky patients, always every single patient newborn presenting with shock rule out cardiac disease. With respiratory distress in newborns, have a low threshold to suspect cardiac lesions. And when murmur, cardiac enlargement, and abnormal peripheral pulses are present in the subgroups of desaturation, shock, or respiratory distress, think cardiac. Knowledge base is required to suspect, and the diagnostic modality echocardiogram requires a skill base which is related to bedside pediatric neonatal echo, which remains the single most important hurdle in the diagnosis of neonatal congenital heart disease. Suspecting cardiac lesions before they get critically ill is an area of focus whereby measuring with pulse oximeter forex midi blood pressure in babies prior to discharge has resulted in ruling out conditions like coarctation and critical conditions which would rule out conditions like interrupted aortic arch and hyperplastic left heart syndrome. So finally, to conclude, the take-home message is an early referral could save the child's life. Involve, involve pediatric cardiologists immediately do not wait. Right diagnosis with a good echo is extremely helpful. Keep prostaglandin available and do not hesitate to call if in doubt. Thank you.